So welcome everyone to our seminar on computability theory and applications. So this is the first talk that we have after some extended summer break. And it's my great pleasure to um, announce our um, speaker today. So today we will have um, a talk that is um, dedicated to applications of computability theory presented by Clara Lö from the University of um, Regensburg. So please go ahead, you have the word. We are uh, curious to see what you have to present. Okay, yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, that's a, it's a first for me to uh, talk to people from the computability uh, community. And um, yeah, so it, it's about uh, work in yeah algebraic topology or maybe large-scale group theory on uh, computability of, of uh, real numbers that occur as values. Um, yeah, before I properly start with the talk, I would like to say that um, on top of the first page, you can see a URL and you can um, like also download the PDF from there. In particular, you will then be able to um, flip back to previous pages. So I will upload um, the talk page by page during the talk. Um, yeah, so all of this is joint work with Matthias Uschold, and he's also here. He's now a PhD student in my group. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the plan is to um, first give a little bit of a, an overview um, of computability of invariance and topology and group theory, and it will not be like a, a general overview. It's just like um, one aspect that I'm also particularly interested in, but that sets somehow the stage and the context for the problems that we are looking at and why we are looking at this and why we are interested in these computability questions. And then I want to talk about the actual results and Altvetti numbers. Um, it's a bit tricky because um, already the definition of Altvetti numbers requires a fair amount of theory. So I will um, take a lot of shortcuts here and there, but try to just, yeah. Um, stick to the, the key ideas of um, how things work and why they work, and then also like present the, the results um, that we have been working on. So yeah, for the general introduction, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm more from, yeah, geometric topology, algebraic topology, large scale group theory. So maybe I should briefly explain of, like in general what we do, right? So let's say um, in algebraic or uh, geometric, Um, topology. Yeah, so what do we do? We, we are looking for invariance, and in particular, we are looking for homotopy invariance. Um, yeah, so how is that supposed to work? So let's say we have topological spaces. And then from topological spaces, we want to convert them into, maybe in the simplest case, into real numbers, okay? So these numbers should tell us something um, about the spaces. And this should not be like a completely random uh, association, of course, but we want to have this uh, invariance property. So if we have two topological spaces, that are roughly the same, so they are homotopy equivalent, so they're the same up to continuous deformation, then we want that they have the same, um, they have the same value. So let's call this invariant i, and then we want that these get the same values. Okay, so that's like the, the key idea of algebraic topology, um, is that you want to distinguish topological spaces um, by finding invariants that separate them, so invariants that have different values on your um, spaces that you want to distinguish. Okay, so that's the like that's the ob overall thing, and um, yeah, maybe I should also give some examples of such invariants, right? So, um, what are typical examples? And usually, I mean, in many cases, you will restrict to particular classes of spaces. So maybe let's go for the, the true classic of all invariants, the Euler characteristic. Okay, so how is this defined? Well, maybe it's good already to restrict now to a smaller class of spaces. Maybe let's um, restrict to finite simplicial complexes.
So what's a simplicial complex? Well, it's something like a graph, but it's allowed to be higher dimensional. So you have vertices and um, you have edges. Yeah, so that would be a graph. But then you can also have triangles and tetrahedra and higher dimensional things, but it's always like built up from these higher dimensional triangles. So that's a um, simplicial complex. If you only have finitely many things, it's finite. So it's a pretty combinatorial thing, but you also see that you get a space. So what's the other characteristic of such a um, finite simplicial complex? It's denoted by a little chi. And then let's say our um, finite simplicial complex is x. Then um, the Euler characteristic is just you take the alternating sum of the numbers of cells that you have. So it's alternating sum minus one to the j times the number of j simplices in x. So it's the number of these triangles, right? That you have. You first count the vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of triangles and so on. Okay, so this gives a number. And yeah, so it's kind of, it's important that you do this alternating sum because otherwise it would not be homotopy invariant. You can easily check this. Why it's homotopy invariant if you take the alternating sum, um, that would be uh, leading a little bit um, further astray, but it's a, a basic fact of algebraic topology. It's one of the key insights, I would think, of classical algebraic topology. Okay, and then you can, you can go on. So this is certainly just, a, this is an integer. And um, maybe another thing, like a, an upgraded version of this, maybe is the so called Betty numbers. Okay, so there's no L2 yet, it's just Betty numbers. So, what do you do? Um, you look, oh, they are denoted by little b kx, and let's do it over the reals. So, what's that supposed to be? This is the dimension over the reals of the case, and then this is called homology of our finite simplicial complex. Um, it's maybe not so super important to know what this is. It's just in, like um, these are vector spaces in this case that are associated to the um, simplicial complex and they somehow they are able to count the k-dimensional holes inside of X. Okay, this is also classical invariant from algebraic topology and maybe um, uh, a thing that is noteworthy here um, is that then the Euler characteristic turns out to be the alternating sum of these um, Betty numbers. Yeah? And in fact, this is um, a good way of, of proving that the Euler characteristic indeed is a homotopy invariant, because for these homology groups, it's somewhat easier to show that they're homotopy invariant. Okay, so that, that would be things. And then um, that you could look at. And then another thing that one could look at that's maybe also known is you could ask whether the um, fundamental group of your um, simplicial complex is trivial or not. So, so the fundamental group is just a group that you get um, by looking, so it's denoted by pi one of x, it's by looking at all of the loops inside your space, right? You look at loops and then you um, identify loops if they are, can be deformed into each other. So it's clearly um, uh, a homotopy invariant. Um, it's maybe not so clear how to, um, how to compute it. Well, in principle, it's, it's I mean, the, the question is well, what does it mean to compute it, right? Um, in principle, it's not so difficult uh, really because um, you can just read off a presentation from your finite simplicial complex. But um, yeah, of course, this is also already where the, where the problem lies, right? So that's um, what we would do in maybe in algebraic or in geometric topology. And then for groups, um, there is a trick to um, convert um, groups into spaces. So, Whenever you have a group, let's call it gamma, then you can turn it into a very special um, space. It's called B gamma. It's a classifying space. In particular, the fundamental group of this thing will be the group. It has further um, topological properties. So it's universal covering is contractible, whatever that means. But it's a, it's a way of um, somehow reflecting group theory inside of topology. And then, of course, once you have a space, 
you can just take your invariant um, applied to this space. So this is a topological space. Okay, so this is a way of turning groups into spaces. And then whenever you have a homotopy invariant, you can also apply it to groups if you like. Okay, maybe I'll quickly upload this. Um, um, yeah. Okay, so these are the invariants that we're typically interested in. And then of course the, the key question, this is why we are here is, well, if you have your invariant, is it computable? Okay, so that's the... Okay, and maybe let's... Um, Let's uh, stay in the picture of finite um, simplicial complexes. Yeah, so let's um, give some examples. So for finite simplicial complexes, okay. So I mean, clearly the Euler characteristic that's certainly computable, right? You just uh, need to count the number of simplices, do the alternating sum, done, right? So. Um, all the characteristic is computable. That's good. Okay. Then how about the Betsy numbers? Um, well, I didn't give you the definition, but this is just um, finite dimensional linear algebra, and the like the matrices that are that occur, they are all um, they have integer entries, so it, I mean also can just compute it in an exact way. So that's computable and it's also pretty efficient. So that's it's a good thing. You can do it. Okay, but then, um, as you are probably uh, very well aware of, like this triviality of pi one, this is undecidable. Okay, okay. So I mean, not every nice invariant is is computable in a nice sense, um, but um, yeah. So the 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 meta observation maybe is that. Well, many, many, many invariants, they don't come out of the blue, so they carry some kind of traces of computability. Maybe it's not really computable from like the original structure that you get a complete com computation, but sometimes, um, well, at least the values themselves, they are not random real numbers, but they carry some computability structures. So um, yeah, let me call this a meta observation. Yeah, so many non-computable invariants, yeah, in, in topology or in group theory, um, somehow have some traces of computability. Yeah, at least for the for the values that occur. Okay, and um, maybe I, I give you some concrete examples. I don't want to give definitions, so it will basically be just terms and names of things, but just to um, tell you that this is not like an empty subject. Yeah, so um, some concrete examples. Um, maybe I, I start with a manifold topology. So if you have two oriented closed connected manifolds, you can ask what are the possible sets of degrees of maps between them. So that's a fairly reasonable um, geometric question. Okay, and so then you have, a, you have a subset of the integers and now you can also turn it into a real number by taking binary expan uh, expansions or what, but you can also of course view it as subsets of um, the integers and um, these these things will be um, recursively enumerable. Yeah. So the the it's not so clear um, whether they are actually recursive. I have no idea, but at least they are recursively enumerable. Um, the same thing is well, if you have simplicial volume, this is also it's an invariant. It's a real value invariant of manifold and there it will turns out that the that the values that you get these are right computable reals 
And again, we don't know about um, whether they're actually computable reals, but what we do know is that there is no algorithm that given a triangulation of a manifold computes this in Fisher volume. That's impossible, but um, yeah, at least the, the values, they still have some, um, uh, some structure. So um, this is manifold topology, let's say. Okay, and then maybe I, I give some um, examples um, from group theory. So you can look, for example, at the rank gradient. This is something that um, looks at how difficult is it to generate your group. Um, and you can look at this for finitely generated recursively presented groups, or you can look at something that's called stable commutator length. Um, so this is something um, that you can define for group elements. So these are invariants that also they are in general, um, you can't expect them to be really computable, but um, the values that occur, again, they're right computable reals because they are basically, it's defined by a, some kind of infimum over something. So it's not so surprising that you get, um, that you get these uh, these things. Okay, so this is group theory, and maybe to be precise here, I should say of finitely generated recursively presented groups. Otherwise, things will break. Okay, so uh, yeah, you can see that there are examples where you see that you cannot compute the whole thing, but at least the values still have some kind of um, some computable structure. Okay, so I'll upload this and then um, I'll tell you why we are interested in that. I mean, you, I mean for, for you, it's maybe natural to ask, okay, um, is this uh, thing computable or not? Um, for topologists, not so much, I would say. And um, let, me, let me give you a reason why we find this interesting. So, um, yeah. okay, so why is this interesting? And of course, um, well, if you have a computability of values, yeah, then this certainly means that these values, they're very far from being arbitrary. So this gives restrictions on the possible sets of values. And in particular, this gives you a way of proving that certain things cannot occur as a value. So this gives you um, non-realizability results. Yeah, so for example, um, in joint work with Nikki Hoyer, we use this for simplicial volume to exclude the specific values um, as occurring as a simplicial volume. And so we, we try to understand the set of possible values and of course, like there are very, um, there are very concrete um, approaches to this. On the one hand, right, you you can try to realize specific numbers, but then you might also ask, okay, what what are examples of things that we cannot realize? And there we use this um, computability aspect to rule out certain values. Okay, so this is this is um, at least why I am interested in these questions, and also there are, mm, for several real valued invariants in algebraic topology. So open problems that, you know, usually they ask for something that's much stronger. For example, there's the Atiyah conjecture, which deals with l 2 Batya numbers, um, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, and that the question is whether under certain conditions, they will always be integers. Of course, this is asking for much, much more than just computability of the values, but you can see that you maybe can try to also come from this direction to exclude certain values. Okay, so I, I know this was all very uh, vague, but maybe now it becomes clear why we want to do these things. And I want now to quickly give some kind of an introduction um, to L2 Betty numbers, um, which is a bit uh, challenging because as I said, this is a, a topic that requires a, a fair amount of background of all kinds of things. But I already told you that they are the usual Betty numbers, right? And um, yeah, maybe I, I recall this here, like the usual Betty numbers. 
And I just told you that they are dimensions of something. Dimensions over the reals over some of some real vector space. However, that vector space is defined. Maybe it's not so important. Okay. And the idea of L to Betty numbers. Is the following. So maybe one needs to understand the setting that we are now on. Now we are not just considering a space, but we are now considering spaces that have a certain amount of symmetry. So we are considering a group action on a space. And then the idea of L to Betty numbers is well, now we have this group. Um, so somehow the group should also play a role in the definition. So this is kind of an equivariant version of dimension. Okay. So this is a Equivariant version of um, yeah, Betty numbers. So we take um, equivariant dimensions of slightly modified homology groups, whatever. So um, yeah, so what we need is this, we need this equivariant dimension. So now we should remember that in the classical setting, well, how can you a compute the dimension of something. So um, in the classical case, let's take um, a subspace of R to the N. So this is a real subspace. Then, um, okay, now we want to talk about the dimension. And of course, usually you would say, oh yeah, I pick a basis and then I count the number of basis elements. But this is um, not a good idea in this equivariant setting because the, like the module theory in this equivariant setting is far too complicated. The, the structure theory is really much more complicated than in the, in the real case. So counting basis vectors is not really an option. So we need a different description of the dimension. And um, what one can do is the following. So if you have a subspace of Rn, our n carries an inner product. So you can look at the orthogonal projection of our n onto v. So let's look at the orthogonal projection onto v. And now if we want to know the um, dimension of our space, one way of doing it is just computing the trace of this um, orthogonal projection. Okay, so the only thing that we need is we need a trace. Okay, and orthogonal projections and everything. So in the L2 case, we take this um, as the definition. Okay, so that's the idea. So, um, well, we have certain modules that we want to compute the dimension of in this equivariant way. So what we have to do, we have to look at these orthogonal projections also in the equivariant setting. And then we only have to know what the trace is. So um, yeah, I will give you the definition of this trace, okay? Um, because that's important for what follows, but this is now, I mean, basically you can forget everything that I said. Um, defining this trace is, is very simple. Okay, so let gamma be a group. And um, yeah, so let's say we have uh, a trace and in order to define a trace, we need the square matrix, okay? So A is an N times N matrix over C gamma. I'll say something about this in a second. Okay, and then we want to define the trace of this. And let's denote it by C gamma. So the C gamma trace of A is something. So, okay, now I have to explain what C gamma is. So this is the group ring. Um, of gamma uh, over the complex numbers. And it's basically what the notation already suggests. What you do is you take linear combinations, finite linear combinations of your group elements, and then you have these coefficients. And in this case, they are complex numbers, okay? And um, yeah. So as a, as a C vector space, it's just generated, freely generated by the elements of gamma. And then you multiply elements in this ring by just like writing down the obvious uh, like distributive law. Okay, so this is how you um, 
work in this group ring. So that's that's a ring. Okay, so um, now we want to define the trace um, of such a matrix. Okay, then if you if you want to define a trace, of course, as usual, you will take um, the sum somehow over the diagonal coefficients. But now I said we wanted to do everything like with taking this group action into account. So we will not like sum up, I don't know, all the, the diagonal entries. That's bad because it would give an element in C gamma and that's something that we don't want. So um, what we actually do is we only take the coefficient that appears at the position of the neutral element in our linear combination. Yeah, so this is the, let me write it like the E coefficient of A, J, J. So this diagonal matrix entry of A, and then we always take the coefficient at the neutral element of this matrix. So somehow you see that we only take a part of this matrix and this corresponds to this like, yeah, doing this over the, um, over the group. Okay, and um, what you get in the end is just a complex number. Yeah? That's it. That's the trace. Okay, so I think that's a somehow a fairly uh, simple definition. And um, now I need to define some kind of L to Betty number, but I want to do it as painless as possible. So um, again, let's take a matrix. And now it's also okay if it's not a square matrix. So let A be an M times N matrix over this group ring. Okay, then what we get from this is we get an operator, let's call is this R A upper two, and how finally L2 enters. Namely, we consider this on L2 gamma to the M to L2 gamma to the N. And basically this is just right multiplication by A. Okay, okay, so what's that supposed to mean? So L2 of gamma is just, yeah, you take the L2 completion of gamma, okay? You have, you have your like uh, gamma and then you take L2 summable sequences over gamma. And why do you do this? Because this is a thing that has a nice inner product, right? So um, and inner products are always good. So because inner products give you projections and everything. And um, okay, then you can let this matrix A act um, on, on your tuples of uh, summable sequences. And then we define the L2 Betty number of um, A over gamma. Now, what do we do? Um, well, we just take the trace in the sense above um, of the orthogonal projection onto what? Onto the kernel of this thing. So this is a kernel. This is a subspace of L2 gamma to the N. And then you have to figure out, well, there's a good um, theory of projections and all that for that. You can take this orthogonal projection, you can take the trace, you get a number, okay? And maybe um, I highlight this. So this gives you um, yeah, some kind of uh, number. It will be non-negative because you took a projection, okay? But now this is a, a major difference and this is not a typo, right? Up here, if I take, um, like in the classical case, if I take the trace of an orth orthogonal projection in some finite dimensional vector space, this will always be an integer because this is the dimension. And dimensions are integers in the classical case. In this case, it's just a non-negative real, but like all kinds of reals can appear. Okay, so that's a, that's a major, major difference. Okay, so let me um, quickly upload this page and then I'll um, say a little bit about something about examples, but this is now getting somewhat difficult. So um, yeah, maybe up here, we still have this thing, like if we have a group, then we can turn it into a topological space and we can apply invariance. So now what we can do now is for groups, we can also do the following. So, um, for groups. Okay, on the one hand, so for every matrix, we get um, such an L2 Betty number for this matrix, but we can also associate something directly to the group. So we can, namely, we can say 
that we can take the L to Betty number of the group to be the L to Betty number of um, the corresponding topological space. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Well, if you have the space, and let's assume that this group is somehow of some finite type, meaning that this B gamma is, let's say, a finite simplicial complex. Okay. And then again, you can define um, such uh, homology groups and you can uh, take their dimensions, or you can also look at the Laplacians on these, um, on these simplicial complexes. Then you have um, matrices of this type here, like the A, and then you can take the Alpha-Betty numbers of that. So this gives you these um, non-negative reals. Okay, and we're interested in these numbers, so um, there, there are lots of reasons why one might be um, interested uh, in these numbers. So there are lots of um, yeah geometric reasons, I would say, why why these are interesting. And maybe uh, I just give some example computations um, so that you can at least see something. Um, so, for example, um, you could look at the L to Betty number in degree zero. And then this turns out always to be um, one over the number of elements in the group. So if it's a finite group, then you get just like one over the order of the group. And um, if it's an infinite group, you get zero. Okay. Um, so in particular, what you can already deduce from this is that B02 is not computable from a finite presentation. Okay. This is not computable from finite presentations because um, Yeah, of finitely presented groups, because, um, yeah, well, if, if you could compute it, or if you could decide whether it's zero or not, you could decide whether your group is infinite or not, and this is a known uh, undecidable problem. So there is, in general, there's no hope to compute these numbers. Also, in the higher degrees, it doesn't get any better. Okay, so um, let me give you another thing, so that the higher L to Betty numbers um, are zero, if, okay, K is at least one, and gamma is a billion. And I mean, this is true in much larger generality, but maybe a billion is the like, easiest case to formulate. Um, there are also examples where it's non-trivial and also genuinely non-trivial, not, not only in degree um, zero. So you could look, for example, at the free group of rank two, then you get the value one. But in general, it's fairly difficult to compute them. And um, also, they, they tend to be zero very often. It's, a, it's kind of a slightly mysterious invariant. Um, but what's maybe also good to know, because we talked about the other characteristic before, so we could compute the other characteristic of B gamma. And in fact, this is also computed by um, the algebraic numbers of the group. So um, you can also take here the alternating sum instead of the ordinary Betty numbers, you can take these L2 Betty numbers, well, provided that your gamma is somehow a finite type or something so that you can write down this alternating sum. But it's mainly the only relation that exists between ordinary Betty numbers and L2 Betty numbers. So this is some, um, in, in general, they're, they're completely unrelated. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, we, we have seen that um, how to like define them, at least roughly. Um, we can see that we can sometimes commute, uh, compute them. Um, we also have seen that algorithmically, we don't have a chance of doing it in full generality. There's just no way. And maybe also to like um, wrap this up, this quick introduction, let me mention the following um, theorem by Lukasz Klabowski. Um, It's something that I haven't illustrated yet in my examples, but it's also somewhat tricky to illustrate to give uh, like a very good explanation of why this works. Um, is namely that every non-negative real arises in this way, um, like down here. 
um, in uh, in star, let's call it star, okay, in this way as an L2 Betty number of some matrix over some group. Um, and the, the matrix is um, in this case uh, with uh, integer coefficients. Okay, so um, let me say, say it like this. So every um, element of the non negative reals arises um, um, yeah, in the form B2 A gamma where uh, gamma is a finitely generated group and um, A is some matrix now um, over the integral group. Okay, so um, yeah, so it, like in general, you don't have control on the on the values, and as I said, um, there are many open problems related to this. Like, how does the group influence the possible values that occur here? But okay, this this result shows if you have general finitely generated groups, anything can happen. Okay, but of course, you also know by counting example, a counting argument that if you restrict to finitely presented groups, then this cannot be true anymore, right? If you have finitely presented groups, there are only countably many isomorphism types of those. You only have countably, countably many such matrices. So for finitely presented groups, you will not be able to get every real. But then the question is like, what, what do you get? Okay. Okay, so that um, brings me to the last part. Um, maybe I'll just quickly upload this. And um, yeah, then we go into the third part. And this is maybe the, the part that you will like from the type of statements feel most comfortable with because now we're really getting into these computability things. And um, yeah, so maybe I just start with the first result. So let's call this uh, theorem A maybe. So this is joint work with Matthias. As I said, and it's a generalization of something that was already there. Um, namely, there was a already work by Groth um, that did this in degree zero. Okay. Um, yeah. So let gamma again. This is about groups. So let gamma be a finitely generated group. And now we are making um, restrictions on the group, right? Because we want to somehow get restricted values for the Altibeti numbers, so we have to restrict. So, um, and the restriction that we do is on the complexity of the group measured in terms of the word problem of the group, okay? So let's say we have finally generated group and the word problem, Now the like the, the easiest case would be to say well the word problem should be um, should be solvable should be um, just a, a um, yeah computable subset and um, so but we are a little bit more general so we prove a relative statement so we say that the word problem should be of Turing degree um, at most a where a is some um, Turing degree. Then um, let M and N be natural numbers. And then again, we take a matrix um, over the group ring. Oops, okay. And we, again, we take integer coefficients. And then we have the following claims. Uh, the first one is, this is general. Okay, so we have this um, L2 dimension, right? Of a over gamma, and the claim is well. As I said, this is a this is a real. It's a non-negative real, and the claim is that this is a right computable. Oh, 
okay, I mean, I probably in, in this audience, I may assume that you know what a right computable is, but just uh, for safety, let me recall what it means. Well, it means that the rationals that lie above this number, um, you can enumerate them by something of Turing degree at most a. Okay, so this is something of a like restricted, um, yeah, computational com complexity. And um, okay, but a right computable is maybe like right computable is not maybe not what you want. It uh, sounds a little bit um, bad. So under certain circumstances, we can do better. Namely, but this now only um, you can only express it for square matrices. But this is not a big restriction. So if you have a square matrix. Um, a is self-adjoint, yeah, in this L2 sense and equivariant sense. And then there is a condition, and I don't want to explain it. It's an analytic condition. It's called of determinant class. So the determinant refers to the fugler Caddison determinant. So there's something from functional analysis. Um, da -da -da. Uh, then we know that this number that we get here, it's not only right computable, but it's also left computable. So it is a computable. Okay, um, so that's that's the result. And yeah, so the, the result by Groth was um, for degree zero and we somehow turned it into this um, relative statement. Um, yeah, so yeah, how did we, how did we get into this relative setting? Um, maybe I, I tell the story because it might be interesting. I mean, for, for you, it might be like um, obvious, but I have to admit, I didn't even know that Turing degrees existed before we did the following thing. Namely, um, what we also wanted to do just for curiosity, basically, is um, we wanted to implement some of these results and proofs that we had in a proof assistant. And in this case, it was lean, but it doesn't really matter. And so if you implement in a proof assistant, there are several ways of how you can do this, right? So one way is just you, okay, you, you just start at the beginning and you implement everything, like step by step, every single definition, every theorem, whatever you need. And you, you, know, you build up the complete theory until you are where you want to end up. Um, but that's a lot of work. And also somehow it distracts from the thing that you wanted to do, right? In this case, we would have to do like lots of things. We would have to define the, the, the group rings and then we would have to define like these traces and dimensions and whatnot. And then we would have to also um, prove all kinds of things about like computable numbers, computable sequences, whatnot. So because like much of this theory is not available in the libraries. And we didn't want to do this because that's somehow it was besides the point, right? We wanted to think about L2 Betty numbers and stuff. So somehow we um, chose a different approach um, and we implemented an abstract version, right? So where we basically declaratively say what kind of properties things should have. So we describe them and give like, let's say axioms for them. And then we somehow conclude our results from that. So we have like a foundation that we work with and then we conclude from there. But this foundation is pretty abstract and it's like already high level. So we put everything in there that we want. And in particular, um, we realized that it doesn't really matter how computable is defined. We only needed certain properties. And that's why we saw, okay, this is a relative statement. Like once you know how complicated the work problem is, then you can limit the complexity of what you get for the alphabetic numbers. Okay, and then we thought, yeah, something has to be out there in the theory like that describes this, and that's how we um, stumbled across the Turing degrees. But it was like in a very roundabout way. It's just um, might might be interesting to to see this, like how this um, process of abstraction somehow led us um, to to look into this. Okay, so maybe I give a very, very brief sketch of the proof of how this works um, so that you see how the word problem, how it comes into that uh, at all. So I will not talk about the proof of the second part. I will only um, talk about the, the proof of the first part. Okay, so let me get here a sketch proof of one, okay? Okay, so and it all starts with the following proposition. By look. 
So look to the approximation theorem for L to Betty numbers of residually finite groups and expressing the um, L to Betty numbers in terms of ordinary, normalized ordinary Betty numbers of finite index subgroups. And in particular, um, the following thing appears. So um, yeah, let's, let's assume we have such a matrix. And here, um, yeah. We have such a such a matrix over the group ring. And now we need a number, and this number has to be big, and you can say how big expressed in terms of this operator on the L2 spaces. Okay, so you have this right multiplication by the matrix. This has an operator norm, and you just need to have a number that's bigger than that. Okay. And then you can look at the following sequence. So let's call it C A K P. So it's called C because it's characteristic um, sequence. Okay, so how do you um, compute this? Well, you look at the following. You take one minus, you, you look at certain polynomials in terms of this matrix, um, one over K squared. This is just to compensate for the term that will follow. And then you will um, force um, it to be self-adjoint. So you take A times A star, take the pth power of that. Okay, so this is a this is a matrix, square matrix, and then you take the trace of that over C gamma. Okay, so this gives you a sequence of non-negative reals. And the claim is this is not just any sequence, but it's monotonously um, decreasing. And um, if you are interested in the L to Betty number of A over gamma, this is just the limit of this sequence. Okay. So that's the, maybe the key insight about L to Betty numbers that you need. And um, just to say one word about the proof, because it's maybe not so clear where this is supposed to come from. So the proof um, uses the spectral theory. So you need to look at the spectral measure of this operator. Yeah, so this is a spectral measure. And then you need uh, like analytic approximation properties to um, to derive this. Okay, but then it's like from then on, it's, it's basically standard analysis. Okay, so that's um, that's the key key input. And then um, in order to prove part one, so from A, yeah, so we can just compute a rough K. That is at least as big as this norm. And how can you do this? For example, you can look at all the entries in A, you look at all the coefficients, take the absolute values, take the maximum of that, that will certainly be big enough. Okay, so that's certainly something that you can compute um, if you have A. Okay, and then um, for each P, so now um, you compute this entry in the characteristic sequence, okay? And let me spell out the value again that you have to look at. So it's one minus one over K squared times A A star to the P, okay? And now you have to remember how, how this all went. So, okay, if I have a matrix and it's given in like, you have all the matrix entries, and then, of course, I can compute the adjoint, just taking the adjoint, um, transposing, and then um, applying the involution and the group ring. So that's easy. Um, you multiply them. OK, that's also algorithmically possible, right? You know how to multiply matrices. You take 1 over k squared. Yeah, I mean, I, I pick a nice um, k squared. So that's that's also possible. I Then 1 minus that, t p power, that's all. We know how to do this, OK? So that's. That's computable from A, okay? Not an issue at all. Okay, but then you have to compute this trace. And we have to recall how the trace was defined. For the trace, you had to sum up over the diagonal entries, but not just the diagonal entries, but you had to pick the component of the neutral element. And in order to do this, you need control on the work problem. So this uses the work problem. 
that's where it enters. But it's exactly the same complexity, right? If you can solve the word problem of Turing degree at most R, R then you can also compute this trace with Turing degree at most A. Okay, and then you have a sequence, you computed the sequence of which you know um, that is monotonically decreasing and it will um, converge to your number and then you're done. Okay, so this, this proves the first part. For the second part, you need more control on this convergence, right? You um, also need somehow um, control from below. And this is where this determined class condition enters and this gives you the, yeah, um, in an analytic way, it gives you these additional controls, but it's maybe not so important. Okay, so this is how we prove this in principle. So maybe I upload this and then I'll um, tell you about some further results. But um, put this further into context. So, um, but I will not um, say much about the proof. I will just state the theorems. So the theorem B, again, with Matthias. And this is also, um, this generalizes this previous work, and this was um, work by um, Pichot, Schick, and Juk. And um, yeah, so this basically is about like the converse, okay? So let's say let A be a Turing degree, but it should not be any, it should be innumerable. Turing degree. Okay. Um, and then you might ask, well, what about um, all the alphabetic numbers that you could get from all the groups of um, word problem at most this? Um, okay. So then uh, the set of alphabetic numbers. Uh, arising. From finally generated groups. And now, because we want to talk about computable numbers, so we better take them off the dominant class so that we don't have to think about this. Okay, this condition, but it's not, I mean, it's not clear how much of a restriction this is. Probably it's not a restriction, um, but uh, this is related to open problems. So with a web problem, of uh, degree at most A, um, this uh, is just the set of all, yeah, let me just write EC A intersected with um, the non-negative real. So EC A are the effectively computable numbers um, of Turing degree A. So it's, it's a set of all A computable reals, okay? Um, okay, one implication is just from theorem A, and for the other uh, implication, you have to construct concrete, concrete groups that do it, and there we basically follow the construction of Pichot, Schick, and Juk in degree zero and upgrade it um, to this like, relative um, statement. And then finally, well, I told you that like um, the Altibeti numbers are not directly computable from the group or from a presentation of a group, and um, also here we have a result um, because um, you can imagine that if you somehow, if you allow for more Turing degree, then of course you can't compute. And there was a similar result already around, not for L2 Betty numbers, but um, for ordinary Betty numbers of groups. Um, and that was by Nabutovsky and Weinberger. And so we give an L2 version of this. Um, that's the following. So uh, let A um, be again an enumerable Turing degree. Um, then there exists an algorithm and now as I said we have to um, invest a little bit into the degree. So the degree um, is at most a plus four, so that's quite a bit, okay? Um, that does the following. Now, what's the input? Like the, the output is, uh, the desired output is to compute 
um, the binary expansion. of let's say um, the case L to Betty number of gamma. So this is really, you have to take gamma, you have to compute the special um, space out of that. And then you have to compute the L to Betty number. So this is like lots of things that you have to do. And um, that's also why you need um, so much of a Turing degree. And um, in principle, if your gamma is not small enough, then this might be infinite. So the um, algorithm should, detect whether this is finite or not. If it's finite, then um, um, if, well, if it's finite, it should compute the binary expansion. Otherwise, it should tell that it's infinite. OK, and so what do we need as an input? Um, we need a finitely generated group. Um, we need a finite generating set of gamma. Um, and then we need an algorithm that solves the word problem for gamma over S in degree at most A. So we have an algorithm for the word problem of gamma with respect to S of degree at most a, and um, we need a degree in which we want to compute this number, um, namely k, and then the algorithm should compute this binary expansion. And um, yeah, as I said, like why do we need all these Turing degrees? Well, somehow we need to build this special space for gamma. And then basically we can use the tools from before, like once we have built this, we can convert this into matrices, but um, we might need a sequence of matrices and not a single matrix. And then we can like write the L to Betty numbers that we are interested in as iterated limits. And this like, because it's like an iterated limit and for every limit, of course, we also have to invest the Turing degree. And this is how we end up with A plus four in the end. And that's um, everything that I wanted to say. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks for your very interesting talk. So I think we have some time for questions. So are there any questions, comments, remarks from the audience? So you can either raise your hand or directly speak. I think the group is small enough so that you can just open your microphone and speak. One question concerning your talk, so your second result B, you now considered the case of um, of determinant class, but the Grabowski theorem says something that you get all real numbers. Could you also translate it to your first case that you get all right computable numbers if you don't uh, get the determinant okay. class? Yeah, I'm not sure. Pro probably there is a way of doing this. Um, uh, I guess that's yeah, well, open I mean, so the, yeah, I mean, so it, it's somehow it's likely that one can do this. Um, but I have to say, I mean, you would have to like modify the construction substantially. So I'm, no, let me think. Well, I, I, if you have not done it, I don't expect that you can answer it immediately. So, yeah, well, it might be tricky. So here's the here's the thing, like about determinant class. This is more like a, yeah, I mean, it's a condition that one somehow needs improving these things. But there's a huge class of groups where you know that they're of determinant class, and it's not clear whether this class of groups is all groups or not. So that's um, why it's not so clear. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions or remarks? So if not, then, then I have a question um, regarding your, your theorem A. 
So whenever you have such a situation that for your input of a certain Turing degree, you also get an output of uh, that Turing degree. So it's um, in most cases uh, very likely that you get a uniform result. So in other words, given the uh, group represented somehow using the word problem, you can actually uniformly determine that um, number your invariant, the Betty 2 number. Um, so my question is, um, are there any results in this direction and perhaps just of topological nature? So is it known that the Betty 2 index map is upper semi-continuous or something like that? So are there topological, purely topological results in, in this direction? I mean, so first of all, um, I, I think our proof is basically very uniform, right? It yeah. tells you how to do it. One, once you have an algorithm for the word problem, um, if you take this as an input for your algorithm, then it's basically like the description of the Alto Betty number that you get is basically algorithmic because I, I mean, I basically told you how to do it. So, um, yeah. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, but so in, in which sense should it be semi-continuous? Well, I mean, if it's fully uniform, as, as you say, then an alter, alternative formulation of the result could be that the map from the uh, groups to, to the, or matrices to the um, Betty 2 indices is upper semi-computable. And that would imply that is also upper semi-continuous. So upper semi-continuous in the sense that you can approximate the real numbers from above. So not in the usual Euclidean topology, but in, in this upper topology on the reals. And, and such maps are then called upper semi-continuous. Oh, okay. So I, I'm, um, <laughs> I, I don't know any of these things, but um, okay. this, this does sound somewhat plausible, yeah? Yeah. But I, I, I mean, I, I would have to look up the exact terms because, as I said, I mean, we're basically, I mean, I, I know some basic computability theory, but yeah. not, not a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it would be uh, slightly stronger to express it in that way. Essentially, mm -hmm. you would get the same result with the same proof. So your theorem would then be a corollary, but you would have, so to say, a higher degree of uniformity in, in your statement without any further effort, so to say. Mm, okay, yeah, that's good to know. I mean, because also like for from some things, I mean, we we know that we somehow have them, but we wouldn't be able to like express them in a good way. But this might be exactly, um, mm. yeah, might be exactly the notion that uh, yeah, that's missing somehow. Yeah, thank you. So, are there any further questions or remarks? So I don't see any raised hands. So then let's um, use the opportunity to thank our speaker again. So many thanks for your very nice um, talk. So I'll stop the... Uh...